Yeah, deal optimizing Ruby. Let's talk about this topic. First, let me introduce myself. I'm Shohei, a bit difficult to pronounce for you, right? But call me Shohei. I'm a, one of our Ruby core committers since 28 or so, I remember. I was uh, the moderator of the 1.829, or the, I actually created the GitHub Ruby Ruby repo. I, but then I was not an active developer for a while because my job was busy, but I changed my job in last February so that I can now develop new things. I will show you the thing I developed recently today. So let me briefly overview this talk. I implemented what we call a the optimization engine on C Ruby version 2.4. Under some benchmark I show you later, it boosts execution up to 400 times, depending on benchmarks. Also, because this is the first, very first attempt of this kind, it makes lots of rooms for future optimizations. Now, uh, well, I know everyone has said something to say about this, but Ruby is at least not the lang fastest language to run. Uh, this is a screenshot of language shooter site which compares various languages in their speeds. The chart is a uh, comparison of the for, for, uh, several languages. Uh -oh. Sorry. Where is the pointer? I can't show this window. Okay. The, the orange line is Ruby. So you can see that it's not the, uh, and the fastest one is on the left. The slower one is on the right. So it is clear that Ruby is not the fastest language. You can see it's in the right side. And what is kind of interesting is that JRuby is on the right of Ruby, but it's, the chart shows JRuby is actually faster than Ruby, but it kind of mistakenly written in the right side. It's very interesting. So there are many reasons explained why Ruby is slow, like because we have GC or we have GVL or anything like that, but I'd like to say this is all wrong. Ruby is slow because Ruby is not optimized. This is actually this assembly of how uh, one plus two is evaluated. A bit noisy, but all it does is what, put object one, put object two, then send plus. But wait, one plus two, one plus two, it might be three, right? The way we evaluate this is too complex. It should be just three like this, but it's not. The reason behind why we can't do this is because I said one plus two must be three is actually wrong. It could be verified dynamically and globally. So it is pretty difficult to make sure one plus two is always three beforehand. That is the reason why we calculate every time. That being said, redefinitions are rare, kind of. One plus two is arguably three every time. People are not able to break your first grade numbers. So, of course, redefinitions are, are the part of Ruby features, so it, they must work if they do. But the problem is, should they really work fast? So I'd like to introduce a mechanism called de-optimization. Let's just forget about redefinitions because they won't happen, they won't. And only when they do, we then stop and slow, slow away everything to fall back to naive e evaluation. This is actually an overhead, so it makes redefinitions slower. But as, like I said, redefinitions are rare. It works mostly fast. Now, we are take, talking for, uh, taking foreign approaches to tackle first. We do not compile the sequence into machine native ones. We do not introduce new binary format or new type of, execu type of executions. We are going to optimize everything, uh, existing, existing execution sequence to a more sophisticated ones. In doing so, we are going to override the existing execution sequence on the fly. This means we cannot change the length of the sequence. Only modification that preserves length are possible. In reality, we can fill knobs, so 
shrinking the instruction is kind of possible, but to speak, to speak strictly, we can't change the things. Well, this diagram shows a part of Ruby's internals. In a Ruby process, a VM instruction is pointed from iSeq encoded field of RB iSeq constant body struct whose length is iSeq size. Uh, wait, wait. Yeah, this one. Can you show this? Uh, can you see this? Uh, the struct, left side, uh, there's a struct RB iSeq constant body, and it points to a sequence of the instruction. Apart from them, there are program counters somewhere outside of the struct. Program counters typically reside in the machine stack, so they are apart from the, con uh, the management structure. Now, in our implementation, two, few, two new fields named ISEC T optimize and created at are introduced. The ISEC T optimize is a simple copy of ISEC encoded, what was being, what has been here. We'll visit the created at field later. Now, all right, uh, assume we have some optimizations. ISEC encoded got changed from what was originally been. How we cancel this? It's quite easy. We save the sequence for this reason, so just write them back. This is the actual implementation of the optimization engine. Nothing abbreviated, this is the whole. Of course, you can see the main procedure is MCPY. In the last two lines. So what is uh, the advantage of this approach is it's first, first it's expected to be highly portable because it is written in pure C and no JIT2 native assembly is involved. Also the optimization, uh, the, the, the optimization does not touch the program counter at all. This is particularly important because we don't have to bother any VM states because the only thing that should be preserved is the instruction sequence. Preparation is done only once at the beginning. This is also an advantage when we count, encounter a highly evil situation like uh, well, tons of redefinitions are continuing to happen. Now, because we have to know when redefinitions happens, we are going to have a new st state variable. This is the global VM timestamp, which is incremented when something happens. For instance, like uh, constant assignments, method definitions, and module inclusions. This is implementation. A bit long, so not everything is shown here, but you can read, uh, we introduce a new state variable, static, RB, CLT, and blah, 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 and atomic ink that part. It's very straightforward. This is the, where the, the optimization happens. The important part is the bottom half which is a macro named cold method. Strictly speaking, we do the operation right after method, call, method, method calls. This is because the incrementation of state variable ultimately happens inside of this CC call. Can you see this? Can CC call method. So when the call returns, there are chances something happened. We are going to test that here. Another point where the, the optimization can be kicked is VM push frame, where a function called stack frame is made up. This one aims to purge instruction sequence that were run hours ago and became stale at some point. A huge advantage of this approach is it adds almost no overheads. The graph shows a preliminary experiment with all the overheads experiments so far. It invokes methods many times which should be should run the modified part. The graph shows it actually it only adds slight overheads. It does add overheads, but slightly, which is within the margin of error. Okay, let me summarize the part what was shown. We introduced uh, the optimization engine on Ruby. Its main characteristics include consistency of VM states such as program counter. As a result, the engine works very lightweight. Now, we are ready. Let's have optimizations. Like I said, we refrain from touching VM states 
under such restriction, it is still possible to apply some kind of optimizations like this, uh, elimination of methods, folding constants, and eliminating variables. Let's first see the constant folding. It is how a sequence changes before and after optimization in the format. You can see that there are several instructions before, several types of instructions, like get in line cache, get constant, and blah, 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 which was transformed into one put object and a sequence of nups. The nups are meaningless. They don't have anything. Just to, part, to fill the blank area of the sequence. So it, ideally, it changes several instructions into one put object. This is, in fact, pretty straightforward because constant, constants are already inline cache. Can you see this uh, old one? Get inline cache and set inline cache is shown. That inline cache is already stored in the resolved constant. So we replace the setup sequence with already cached constant. This is implementation. Uh, can you see the, the header? It is actual implementation, get in line cache. And the complex if condition, you see, is testing with if the cache hits. And if it does, before we jump to the destination, but before uh, we const fold, that const fold using the value. This is the IB, IEC const fold, very simple. It writes the buffer with what we call a white back pattern with a series of naps. Then fill out the first two words. But, uh, the first two words is put object and constant. By applying the same technique, we can fold one plus two. As you see, the generated output, put object, nop, 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 is the identical to the case of get constant. So you can, see, you can apply the same thing. Its implementation might be a bit small to read, but it's octoplus. It calculates the executed value as usual and folds itself with that value. Not shown in the diff, but the, all the four basic algorithm, arithmetic operations behave the same way. Now, next, send the lamination. In this example, we call method M of receiver self but we are immediately discarding this return value by adjust stack one. It's a waste, so we squash them into a series of nubs. That optimization, however, is not always possible. It depends on how a method is called and how that method behaves. So in this optimization, let us call a method pure if the state is, if the, it's safe to be eliminated. The line is long, long like this. If it's writing to a non-local variable like, uh, well, global ones, it's not pure. When it calls to a block, the method itself might be, might not have any side effect, but the block itself can have side effects, so calling block is ng. Also, when a method is written in C, in this case, that, that, that C method can be pure, in fact, but we have no way to detect it. So we can't say anything, so we err on the side of caution. Lastly, when a method is calling another method, in the case the entire call graph of the method should be pure to say that specific method is also pure. Let's have some example of methods that are not pure. The uh, left upper side, first one, is the accessing an instance variable, so it's in G. The upper right one is calling time.now, which is written in C, so it's also in G. The middle right, left one is yielding. It blocks, uh, it calls block, thus it depends block, so it's in G. And the, and the hash withdrawal, you might think it's okay, but in fact, it, it's actually doing the calling a hidden C method inside. This is uh, some implementation detail, but we do so, so it's ng. And lastly, of course, the RB define method, it, which is, of course, written in C, is ng. So given the so many parts of methods that cannot be 
eliminated. Uh, is there actually, is there, any, uh, is there any method that's actually pure? So it's, yes, there is. For instance, these two. They are, well, selected to be non-minimal, non-trivial example. So there may, might be other, part, other methods that can be pure. But for instance, the left one is the infamous left path algorithm, which pass a string to another. <laughs> and right one is, uh, seems to be uh, some kind of numeric algorithm, but it's in fact uh, called the Leibniz formula that returns a value of pi. These methods are written in pure Ruby and has no side effects, so they are pure. Not however that a method is either pure or not is too simplistic because there are situations we, where we can't say if it is. Suppose, for instance, when we call a method and that results in a method missing. In that case, we can't make sure if this is pure or not until we actually use the method. So in short, we have to detect a method's purity on the fly. At the beginning, everything are marked as not predicted yet state. And as the evaluation progress, some part of the method is detected not pure. Uh, oh, sorry, pure or not. And finally, when everything fixed, the purity of the entire method is set up and then propagated to its colors. All right. Let's say we know a method is in fact pure. Still, that only isn't enough. We have to check how the method is called. That is, if the method is, if the method's return value is used, we can't eliminate. So we focus on the return value. If a method is immediately followed by a pop instruction, which means the return value is immediately discarded, then it's okay. Otherwise, the return value is used somehow, so we can't. This is where we eliminate the send instruction. It happens inside of adjust stack, not in send. The diff is mostly common, but the, it only was the VM eliminated instant instruction, which is this. At sight, it is very similar to the constant folding. It first washes the sequence with the pattern, which is nop, nop, nop. Then if argument RQC is not zero here in the first two words. The RQC manifest is somewhat complicated. For instance, in this example, we call a method M with its argument N. If a method takes arguments, then that argument might have their own side effects, so we, yeah, so if, even when we can eliminate a method call, its argument must be retained, remain untouched. So we have to, we have to fix the stack, stack station state. The argument is pushed on the stack, the send is eliminated, we have to pop that variable. Next, variable assignments. In this case, we are eliminating the assignments of local variables. The set, instruction, set local instruction is eliminated in this example. Sad news is the implementation is not that simple compared to the other ones, like 200, well, 279 lines of code, so it's a bit difficult to show you, but let me tell you briefly what is going on. It's not easy to tell you if a variable is not used at all strictly. That must be called lifeless analysis, and it's very heavy. Because we have to optimize on the fly, we need to do something lightweight. So in this time, we check if a variable is write-only or not. Also, because there are bindings Methods that are not pure might be subject to get bindings and touch local variables from outside of it. 
So we need to restrict local variable elimination to pure ones. Lastly, local variables are shared across blocks. So blocks must be checked with, must be checked and if blocks can really be nest, so we have to check recursively. Okay, let's summarize what was shown. Implement the several optimizations. For those people who major compilers, it is obvious that what I did was very fundamental, very simple ones, no complicated new things. This optimization run on the fly and preserves VM states. I have not mentioned about exceptions at all because it has nothing to do with it. It doesn't interact with exceptions. Okay, now the benchmark. We tested the what is proposed against 2.4 using Ruby's standard benchmark library. The condition is shown, I won't speak them out, but the situation I believe is somewhat normal. No new hardware, no new test suite. This is what you can do now at home. And this is the entire test result in one side. The speed up ratio 1.0 means the speeds are even. Greater number shows our strategy is beating the trunk. And the smaller, the slower. From what we see here, almost all benchmarks are slightly slower actually than the original one. And among them, few benchmarks achieve the extremely fast result. Let's look in detail. The results shown uh, those benchmarks that got faster. And beware, this is an execution time, not the speed up ratio. But if you look at it, you find there are several sets of benchmarks that speed up to the similar execution time like them. This is because they are optimized to generate identical instruction sequence. So the benchmark meant to measure different things, but the optimization turn, uh, converted them into the identical one. So the same result. At the same time, there are cases where we slowed down. One of these benchmarks that is interesting is this VM2 evil method, uh, evil case, which is has tons of what I said, evil activities. This example shows the overhead of the optimization. And it's marginable, I believe, because you know the optimization can vastly slow down evil, but this one only has a few percent overheads. This is, I think, acceptable. Other things slowed down. Notably, the block-related ones are slow. Yeah, because we have to recursively scan blocks in order to, re uh, to detect local variable usages. But, however, variable emanation is in fact powerful because not only the assignment, but also the entire allocation of the object can be skipped. It impacts very much when they work. The fastest examples in the benchmark here, we were those viable emanation got the effect. For instance, the VM1 ZC shot lived. It got faster be, we, because, not because we touched GC, but because we eliminated the allocation. Again, this is the entire benchmark results. You can see it's very simple, uh, very sl it's, well, you can see it's very slightly slow in general when they slow down and drastically fast when they speed up. Okay, so let's have the conclusion. I implemented what we call the optimization on the CRuby version 2.4. Under some benchmark I showed you, below, I showed you, it boosts execution up to 400 times depending on benchmarks. Also because it is the first very fast attempt of the kind, it makes lots of rooms for future optimizations. Let's talk about the future optimization briefly. Subject expression elimination. It can be possible because that should reduce the size of sequence. So it fits perfectly to our strategy. It's, so it can be done right now. More strict libraries analysis and escape analysis has more overhead, but might work might work well, so it is also the time uh, also the subject to 
do. Also, if you choose to allow modification of VM states, uh, well, such as exception tables and such, then there will also be other rooms of optimizations. That's all. Thank you. I'd like to have some questions, but you might be interested in this is actually fast in your application. So this is uh, Rails-wise. I tried running Rails on this, this very laptop, so uh, uh, this is, I got the result. It seems only adds overheads and no optimization was in fact in fact. But the good news is it seems no memory overhead. There's the identical memory consumption. So the benchmark, uh, so the optimization is, well, it doesn't work, but as far as it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It has no overheads. So we still have lots of things to do to make Rails faster. This is the current station, right? Thank you. <laughs>